today we are starting our study in Zechariah. Um, we are going to be doing something called a formal introduction. Of course, you guys know that whenever we teach you guys, we usually try to stick with books of the Bible. Um, that's very, very important to us. Biblical literacy is a huge deal. So, um, so what we do every time we start a new book is we do something called a formal introduction. We're going to talk about that in just a little bit. Uh, but before we do that, let's uh, pray before we get into God's Word. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the faithfulness of your servant, Zechariah. And we thank you for blessing us to be able to be here in this fellowship. And we pray you bless us as we study your word. We pray you guide and direct our discussion. Open our eyes to see that which you wish to reveal to us from your word, Lord. We pray especially that you'd uh, fill my heart with your spirit, that I might speak from the fullness of you in me, teaching through me, because uh, I can't do any of this apart from you, Lord. And I certainly don't want to be speaking from vain arrogance in my knowledge, Lord. We pray that you bless this time to your glory, and we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so, discouragement it happens to all of us at one time or another. Um, I've certainly been there. I'm sure you have. Um, and I can tell you the discouragement apart from the Lord is way worse than discouragement <coughs> with the Lord. I remember those days before the Lord, and the discouragement and hardship, and it, there's just, there's no hope. But when we are discouraged as followers of Christ, we're blessed to be able to look to the promises that have been made by the Lord, the assurances that He has made to us about what He will do. What, and But what's great is that He has shown Himself to be faithful. You know, we often hear about this idea of a uh, leap of faith, which is ridiculous. Um, God has always said he was going to do something and then done it, or said he was going to do something and is in the process of making it happen. Most of the New Old Testament is narrative. You wonder why it's not like the Quran, where you get just page after page after page of commands and instructions and so forth. It's a narrative, the Bible, because it shows God saying, I'm going to do this, and then he does it. These narratives of, of over and over and over again testifying to his faithfulness, his truthfulness. Well, in the prophets, we get something very similar. But the prophets are interesting because they are a nice mix of... God's saying he's going to do something, then we see it happen in history, but then he says other things that haven't happened yet. Well, in the case of Jerusalem and Israel, in, in Zechariah's time, they had been exiled, they had come back from exile. We're going to talk a little more about the historical context here in just a little bit. But they needed encouragement because their city is in shambles. There's people around them coming around to discourage them from the rebuilding process that they're trying to go through. If you're familiar with uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, we'll talk about it a little bit today. They're, they're very discouraged. But God comes in by way of the prophets and gives them hope. He says, look, these things have happened in the past, and this is what's going to happen, the restoration of your people. We've already seen some of the things that we're going to hear in Zechariah fulfilled. We'll talk about those in the coming weeks. The things that Zechariah prophesied from the mouth of the Lord that have actually already come to pass. But we're also going to see things that have not come to pass yet, things that we can look forward to and hope. But what we see over and over again in the message of the prophets is this idea of the Lord has shown himself faithful and he is going to show himself faithful again. So in times of discouragement, we have to look at those promises that he's provided. So today we're going to work on the formal introduction of Zechariah. We're not going to get too much into the text itself. We're going to concentrate more on the context, uh, which is a really huge deal. Anytime Jeremy and I do a new book, we start with a formal introduction. So we're going to work on that with Zechariah today. Uh, by the way, anybody recognize this? Of course you do. You want to take a stab at the, I mean, obviously it's Zechariah, but where from? You can take a wild guess, you'll probably get it. Sistine Chapel. Yeah, Sistine Chapel, yeah, yeah. It's one of the additions to Sistine Chapel there. All right, so what is the purpose of a formal introduction? Context. Context is king. Now, I will tell you, and you'll probably get tired of me doing this because I pro I've probably done this spiel with you before, uh, because I do this spiel every single time I do a formal introduction. I don't know what Jeremy does. Uh, you know, who knows what he does? Um, but I do this spiel every time I do a formal introduction because it's that important. So, no, I'm sorry? Duke on spieling, yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, n <laughs> no. <laughs> so Hill's sixth rule of interpretation, the more you know of the context, the closer you can get to the essential meaning of the text. The more and more I understand about the context of the writing of a text, the more I can understand why things are written the way they're written. Of course, now, you're probably wondering, what are the other five rules? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so the first rule is context. This is my number one rule, context. We need to understand the author, his history, as best we can. In some cases, we really can't do very much. We need to understand uh, the time period in which he lived, the people he lived with, why he's writing what he's writing. The second rule is context. We have to understand the history, what's going on in the world during that time, the geography, what, what's the political layout at the time. This helps us understand why things are being said the way they're being said. The third rule is context. We have to understand the grammar, the syntax, the language. <laughs> Now, obviously, a lot of us are at a disadvantage. I, I will tell you, I know I've been to seminary, but my, I'm still in the process of going back and relearning my Hebrew because Hebrew took me for a ride and left me battered and bruised when it was all said and done. So, um, But understanding those comments, understanding the, the turns of phrase and the language and the way he says things helps us understand better. And the fourth rule is, no, it's never trust a plastic hippo. <laughs> And I don't know why my little hippo is not right here, but I've got a little, um, I'm really excited because there's a company called Cafe Press that makes this, I and mean, that was not a plug, by the way, um, that makes these little, um, there's this graphic they've done that says, never trust a plastic hippo, and I'm about to get a little messenger bag with it on the side of the bag. <clears throat> but the fifth rule is, of course, context. So in this case, who's the audience? What are their needs? What's their background? What's their mindset? Now, I will tell you, everything I just told you about context, there's more to it than that. Culture. Uh, it, it just goes on and on and on. The more you can find out about the context, the better you can understand the text. Because a text without a context is a pretext to a proof text. Okay. Now, proof texts aren't bad if they're in context, but most of the time, they're not. So. But very, very important we have context. So that's what we're going to be doing today. Now, when you do a formal introduction, we're looking for certain points of information about a particular book of the Bible. First of all, we're looking for the author. We need to understand as much as we can about him. And bear in mind, I just went through a whole slew of things that you need to understand about context. By doing these data points, you'll figure out most of those things. Uh, the date, when was it written? This provides a lot of information about the political and historical context. Uh, the provenance. Anybody ever watch Antiques Roadshow? Oh, great show. I love that show. Um, they talk about the provenance. Where has it been? Now, in, in antiquing and in art, provenance oftentimes also refers to um, who all's owned it, um, which just is a weird side note. I was look, learning about Chinese calligraphy pieces. You ever notice the little red, the little red stamps around them? That's the stamps of the person who made it and everybody who's owned it along the way. So it becomes part of the actual artwork. Totally random and useless thought for the day, but I just thought it was interesting. But provenance a lot of times has to do with that, right? Who's owned it, where it's gone to, um, who, where it's traveled to, where, where the ownership has been. When we're talking provenance in biblical studies, though, we're just talking about where was it written from? Where's the location of this writing? And of course, that also comes, plays into destination. Where was it written to? Not only who is it written to, but what location to? Because that helps us understand what the people there were undergoing, what the culture was like. So for instance, when we look at the book of Corinthians, we need to know that Paul's writing to the church in Corinth. So what are we going to do in our studies? We're going to look into the culture and city of Corinth. Okay, So that gives us a little bit of an idea. Okay, And then of course, we want to also talk about the purpose. Why are they writing it? Generally speaking, because obviously you're going to dive off into the text and get a little more into it later on. But what's the general purpose of this text that will help guide us through it? Now, you may get through it and look back and say, you know what? I thought I understood the purpose, but I need to modify that based upon what I've found as I've gone through. Okay? So these are our primary things we look at whenever we're looking at a formal introduction, and that's where we're going to be going today. And I'm sorry if I'm blocking you. I'm always bad about my left shoulder. So, All right, so what we're going to do is take a little bit of time to go through ancient Israel history. Now, I don't know about you, but I love history. I love the history. Well, I like the History Channel back in the day when it was history. I don't know what they do now, but Pawn Stars and Big Tuna and all that. Just, I, I'm, I'm lost. So, 
<laughs> yeah, 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 American Pickers. <laughs> anyway, um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through ancient Israel history from the Exodus so that you can understand, at least in terms of the historical dates, when Zechariah is going on. You'll have to bear with me because Zechariah is quite a ways down the road. Okay, so we're going to take a little trip through time here. Okay, so the first thing is about 1446 BC is when the Exodus happens. Okay, Israel's brought out of the Egyptian bondage. Um, they've been there for, and I know this is shocking because uh, we've just kind of, this is kind of a new thing. They were there for about 230 years. You're probably used to hearing 400, but what we find out from Paul in Galatians is it was 430 years between the giving of the promise to Abraham to the Exodus. So we have to be really careful about when we date that. So they're there about 230 years, which explains why there's so few people in the genealogies between Levi and Moses. Um, so that makes way more sense. But they're there for about 230 years-ish. And then in 1406, they come out of uh, the wilderness wanderings and enter into Canaan under the leadership of Joshua. So they're there for 40 years. Okay, And the reason why we date that off of that is because we're we know where this happened, and so we just date it 40 years later whenever they come out of the wilderness wanderings. Then in 1358, this is when the time of the judges begins. Okay. Now I will tell you there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of talk about how long or short the period of the judges is, so this is a little bit of an estimate. But Joshua dies in the time of the judges begins. Then around 1050, this is when Saul becomes the first king of Israel. Okay. So got about a 350 year span there. Right. No, I guess it's almost about 300 years. 300-year uh, span there between the judges, the beginning of the judges, and Saul becoming king. Of course, Saul dies 40 years later, and David becomes king of Israel. And then a little bit later, 970 B.C., Solomon becomes king of Israel. And then when Solomon dies, the kingdom divides. So we had a united kingdom up to that point. And then in 930, the kingdom divides. Rehobo uh, Rehoboam the first, who is the son of Solomon, comes in and is pretty oppressive. So Jeroboam, who is not in the Davidic line, uh, starts a whole other branch up in the north and they branch off. The northern kingdom becomes Israel and the southern kingdom calls Judah, okay? Um, which is very confusing at times when you're reading in the text with the prophets what they're talking about. But, and we're actually gonna see in Zechariah, Israel is oftentimes referred to as Ephraim because Ephraim is one of the tribes of Israel, a lot of times it's used as kind of the corporate name for the northern tribe of Israel as well. So that gets us up to 930. Everybody with me so far? Jack, you got a look on your face. Okay. Sounds good. In perspective, we're not even 300 years ourselves as a nation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excuse me about that time. Yeah. Yeah, and if you know anything about the judges period where there's this cycle of repent, fall away, judgment, restoration, repent, judgment, fall. I mean, it just it 300 years of that. It's it's Don't get me wrong, it's going to get worse. But yeah, 300 years of that. In 722, however, after years and years and years of rebellion, Israel is uh, excuse me, are we there yet? Yeah. So uh, is taken by the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians have slowly been rising up through the ranks. They're sort of the northern Mediterranean or Mediterranean uh, Mesopotamian region. I should have put maps up here. Um, but Assyria <coughs> comes in and is a tool of God. And we see this in Isaiah, where Isaiah talks about this. Assyria will come in and becomes a tool of God's judgment against the northern kingdom that has rebelled constantly since its foundations. That was ten tribes, right? Yes, yeah, there are two tribes. Yeah, that's something I should point out. The southern tribe, the southern kingdom is called Judah, but it's actually two tribes. The other ten go north. Because they were governing, they're also called Jews when they're Yeah, exactly. So that's why uh, we refer to them as Jews from Judah. Um, and then, of course, before that, they're Hebrews. But, uh, in 612, the Babylonians conquer the Assyrians. They take the Assyrians and, and subsume all that that they've conquered as well. Um, and then in 586, the southern kingdom falls. After all their rebellion, uh, Babylonians come in and take them as well. After multiple uh, attacks and assaults and carry off, but ultimately 586 is the big date. So, 
So that gives you some perspective on the exile, okay? So this is really important because this is gonna be kind of the bouncing off point into Zechariah, okay? The exiles have happened and they go away. Then in 539, Babylon falls. I was so excited and I know I'm a nerd, but I was reading Herodotus this week. I know I'm a nerd. I was reading Herodotus and Herodotus actually has a, in his first book, he has the account of Cyrus the Great taking Babylon. The Persians come in and take Babylon and it's the exact same as the biblical story. He talks about the uh, river being diverted so that the, they can come in on the city gates and he, and he says the city is so large that the people didn't even realize they had been conquered because he sneaks in during the night and does that and he specifically says because they were also at festivals. Of course what's going on during that time? Yeah, Belshazzar is having his little feast so I just thought it was really—it's really creepy when you read it in other accounts outside the Bible because you're like, "Oh, that's that's awesome," but yeah, uh, Cyrus the Great comes in and takes out Babylon, and suddenly the Persians are the big dog on the street. Okay, uh, very interesting story behind Cyrus if you ever get a chance to do that. But again, I'm a nerd, and Herodotus is where you're going to find that. In 538, Cyrus II declares the return. Cyrus II is Cyrus the Great, by the way. Uh, 538, very quickly after he conquers Babylon, he tells the Jews, "You can go back." and start rebuilding. But here's what's interesting, he sends them back and the first thing they start working on is not the walls, they start working on the temple, which is really bad strategy. Really bad strategy. You don't go back and start building your temples. You go back and you start building your walls. Right, but God has them do what first? Yeah, but who is the defense is the, what's amazing. Because Jerusalem's not supposed to be relying upon walls to defend her. She's supposed to be relying on who? God. So he, has, so he sends them back to work on the temple, not the walls. And that's the story we get in Ezra. Okay? So in 536, they really start coming back. The waves start really coming back in. And that's when they start laying the foundations for the house of the Lord. Come on. So... 520 and 5 through 518. This is when Zechariah is writing. People are starting to come in and discourage the rebuilding of the temple. You got people and, and governors and all sorts of figures that from the surrounding areas around Jerusalem under the Persian domain that are coming in and causing problems for them. If you read Ezra, you'll notice these guys coming in and, and discouraging them from the work and making them nervous about continuing this work. But Zechariah, Haggai as well come in at this time. In fact, we read in, Ze in uh, Ezra that it's Haggai and Zechariah who come in to encourage them in the work of rebuilding the temple. So this is one of the backgrounds for Zechariah is that he's coming in trying to encourage them in their building of the temple and rebuilding of the temple. So this is the setting that we find him. Now we know very specifically that it's 520 through 518 because Zechariah thankfully starts off his narrative with, in the eighth month of the second year of Darius, which tells us exactly when this is. Okay, Darius takes power in 522 and presto. Now I have seen, if you do the real date, it's really around like February of 519-ish. But, um, but the way it comes out is about 520 to 518. Dates are a little sketchy back then, so give or take. So, but it's between about 520 and 518 is when uh, Zechariah is doing his uh, prophetic work here, okay? There you go. That's the history that gets us up to it. Any questions? Haggai, Dare I ask? Haggai yeah. got his prophecy in the sixth month, two months before. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that was to build that house. Yes, 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 yes. And if you haven't had a chance to, to um, read Haggai, it's, re it's really great. He's very vivid on this thing where, you, you know, you guys, are, you guys are more worried about building your own houses and worrying about all that rather than building my house. Um, really, really good stuff. But Zechariah's focus is a little bit different. So that puts us in the context where we are at. Return from exile and the focus is on building the house of the Lord. We're not to Nehemiah's time when the concentration is going to be rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem just yet. Okay? So let's talk about Zechariah. I don't know. Oh, okay. There we go. Details about Zechariah. Uh, it is the longest of the minor prophets. Let me assure you, <laughs> he's not the longest of the prophets. Because we spent two years going through Isaiah in our class, which, by the way, you can watch on YouTube if you would like. Um, 66 chapters later, whew, 
Um, but it is the most cited Old Testament text during the Passion Week of Christ in the Gospels uh, because there's a lot in the text about the Messiah. A lot. Uh, they will look on him whom they have pierced. Have we heard this before? Um, talks about the striking the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. All that imagery. Uh, it's the most cited Old Testament book during the Passion Week. So um, very, very much focused on that. Also a lot of apocalyptic stuff as well. Many messianic and kingdom prophecies. Uh, prophecies about Jesus, but also prophecies about the coming kingdom of Christ uh, in this particular text. There's a, there's a lot of encouragement, don't get me wrong, on, on focusing on rebuilding the temple and reassurance of where they're at in, in their own context, but there's a lot of attention being given to the coming of the Messiah and the coming of his kingdom as well. And of course it's an encouragement to the hope and fulfillment of the word of the Lord. Uh, we look back, um, if uh, I'm teaching um, Genesis through Deuteronomy this fall at the Cypress Discipleship Institute, and one of the big things that I have for Genesis through Deuteronomy is you have to understand those books if you're going to understand the rest of the Bible. Because they lay down the law, they lay down the expectations, they lay down the promises. Well, God made all these promises about restoration in Deuteronomy 30. Well, here comes Zechariah. As one of my professors once said, look, the prophets aren't telling us anything new. They're just re-commentating on Torah, on Genesis through Deuteronomy. That's all they're doing. And so Zechariah comes along to say, look, you remember the covenant? Here it comes. Restoration. I, he's going to rebuild it. He's going to restore us. And it's this restatement. I mean, technically it is new, but it's based upon Genesis through Deuteronomy. So let's talk about Zechariah real quick. Uh, not much is known about him, unfortunately. This is one of these authors where we don't just have a ton of information. Uh, we get information about him from Ezra 5. Uh, we have just a little bit of time I can read. Uh, when the prophets, uh, this is the middle of Ezra when they're talking about building the temple, uh, beginning of chapter 5. When the prophets, Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Iddo, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of God of Israel, who was over them, then Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel and Jeshua the son of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat. Ah, I was going to get through the whole thing without messing up a name. <coughs> Josedach arose and began to rebuild the house of God which is in Jerusalem and the prophets of God were with them supporting them and again in 614 we hear uh, him mentioned again and the elders of the Jews were successful in building through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Iddo so that's where we see them mentioned but we don't know much about them Iddo is a Levite or a priest uh, he is a guy that uh, Ezra sends a bunch of returning Jews to when, he gets, when they get back to Jerusalem to organize to rebuild the temple as well. But that's about all we know about him as well. Um, but we also see Zechariah mentioned in Matthew 23, 35. And I will try to do my little Bible drill here so we can get this done as quickly as possible. <clears throat> Uh, well, back at the verse 34, uh, this is Matthew uh, recording Jesus' words. Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, so that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. So we don't have any record of that in the Old Testament, but apparently Zechariah was killed in the temple courts. So this temple that he's helping to encourage rebuilding of, he's killed in those temple courts. And then we also get Luke 11.51, uh, which gives us the exact same narrative. Just want to double check. It gives us the exact same narrative about the death of Zechariah. Okay? Uh, it's very similar to the, the comment we get about uh, Isaiah being sawn in half by uh, Manasseh, King Manasseh. Um, we don't actually get that in the Old Testament text. We get a reference to it in the New Testament, and tradition is uh, handed down that that was actually Isaiah that was sawn in half. So, um, but that's about all we've gotten from Zechariah. <clears throat> as far as date, we've already looked at that. It begins at about 520. We get that from Zechariah 1.1 and also 518. In the middle of Zechariah chapter 7, verse 7, we get a switch to a couple of years later. He's continuing on a uh, different set of prophecies. 
And then 9, 9 through 14 is kind of more of a general prophetic about the future restoration and other prophecies that are coming. Uh, we're going to see a lot of interesting figures during that time period. Uh, but it's either connected to 518 or it's a little bit later as well. So, And some people, you'll hear some suggestion that this particular section was written before the exile and so therefore was not by Zechariah. But obviously that doesn't fly. So... Uh, because that's not what they say in the New Testament. So, uh, Written from Jerusalem. This is a post-exilic prophetic work. Pretty straightforward. He's in Jerusalem uh, prophesying and encouraging the rebuilding of the temple. And then, of course, the destination is for the purpose of encouraging to continue the work on the temple and encouragement of the coming restoration of Israel to the Lord's hand. There's a lot of talk about restoring Israel in the midst of all these nations that have... Uh, there's mention there... Um, if we go back to Isaiah, we see that the nations will be the, the tool of the Lord as judgment against Israel and Judah. But in Zechariah, we get a comment where the Lord says, yeah, they judged you, but they went too far. And so they are, they are incurring wrath as well. And so eventually they will get theirs as well. So we end up with uh, prophesying about the judgments that are going to come upon all these nations that have come against Israel and Judah as well. All right. Issues. I don't know what that other one was, but uh, prophetic imagery of, uh, of Zechariah. There's a lot of imagery here that's going to sound familiar, but is not probably what you think. Okay. There's mention of four horns, so our minds automatically go to Daniel when he talks about the four nations and so forth. But they don't fit in Zechariah. They have to be different nations. Now some of them overlap a little bit, but they can't be exact because of the context of Zechariah. You're going to see imagery of horsemen, and your natural inclination is going to be going to the four horsemen of the apocalypse. But that doesn't fit because of the context of who they are in Zechariah. <clears throat> There's a lot of that sort of imagery that you're used to in other texts that mean that were our familiar interpretations that we've seen for years and years and years that are not exactly what you think they are in Zechariah. They're a little more unfamiliar. Uh, you're going to hear, uh, I, I've seen there's a portion here where there's a prophecy about Zerubbabel and Joshua the high priest that a lot of people have applied to the two witnesses in Revelation. Uh, that doesn't fly, not in the context of Zechariah. Uh, different things like that. I just want to warn you ahead of time so that you understand when you see these images, they may not be what you think they are because the context of Zechariah doesn't allow it. Okay, so just a heads up on that. Uh, there's a lot of typological connection to Jesus. Uh, we're going to hear talk about uh, Joshua the high priest, and we're going to see a connection between the two offices of the king and the priest, which we eventually get in Jesus, who is not only our king, but also our high priest. And we're going to see that metaphorically carried out with uh, Joshua the high priest in Zechariah. Uh, a lot, again, a lot of prophetic utterances about Jesus. We've already talked about that. And of course, Zechariah 9 through 14 is very, uh, it's dense. There's a lot to it, and there's a lot of fulfillment that's been done. Uh, for instance, we'll see prophecies, I believe anyway, and I, and I may change my mind by the time we get there, um, but about Alexander the Great. As Alexander comes through conquering, he takes the cities of Tyre and Sidon, Phoenicia, and, and all these other areas to the north of ancient Israel. And we see Zechariah making judgments on Tyre and Sidon. Well, that happens pretty quick after that, about 200 years after Zechariah. Alexander comes sweeping through and judges these cities and these nations. Those things have been fulfilled, but then there are other things that aren't, that clearly have not been fulfilled. And so uh, there's a mix of both in 9 through 14. Now, I want to talk about claiming promises because this is something we're going to need to be aware of. Um, a lot of this is focused on Israel, on the Jews. And I don't know if you checked lately, but none of you are Jews, so far as I am aware. Um, I do have one messianic, well, messianic in Tugab. Um, he's Jewish by heritage, but I don't think he considers himself messianic. Um, but there's a lot that we can't directly apply to ourselves in Zechariah. We have to do the prophets a little bit differently. The prophets, what we have to look to is, what is the attitudes that got the Jews in trouble in the first place? And don't do that. That's a lot of how we have to apply the prophets. We also can look to those promises about the Messiah. We can also look to the promises about His coming kingdom. But we have to be very, very careful not to apply certain things to ourselves. So I want to give you a for instance. 
and we'll and we'll hit these as we go through piece by piece through the text but I just want to make sure that we discuss this before we go through because a lot of times the prophets can be a little tricky when you're trying to apply them you can very easily misapply if you start claiming promises in the text that aren't yours to claim as a Gentile Christian in this age okay so for instance I want to show you um, okay yeah yeah I never but never fear to take hold of the promises of God never because they are firm and that you they can handle all the weight you can put on them okay never fear to take hold of those promises just be careful which ones you actually put your faith on because some of them you can't um, but I want to talk about a couple one that you can and another one that you can't okay so let's look at Matthew 7 7 through 11 um, this is a this this whole thing right here radicalized my understanding of of prayer uh, just shattered my world with regard to prayer. Uh, Jesus is talking about prayer in the in the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask Him? In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want to treat you, for this is the law of the prophets. The point he's making is this. If you know how to give good gifts, how much more so does God? But even more so... If you ask for those things which the Father wants you to have, why wouldn't He give them to you? So, for instance, if I pray for God to make me more loving, does God want me to be more loving? Well, then, of course, He's going to make me more loving. If I, if I ask the Lord to be more gracious, is He going to make me more gracious? Of course He is, because He wants me to be. If I pray for a Porsche 911, is he going to give me a Porsche 911? I don't think God's too concerned with me having a Porsche 911. I'm not even really a big fan. They're tiny little cars. But the difference is, when you ask for things that the Lord wants from you, or things that are genuinely good in His sight, there is no reason why you should not expect it to happen at all. Now, you have to be careful because praying presumptuously for things that you want to happen that may not be in the best interest of God's will, that's another thing. Now, praying for things that you hope will happen if the Lord is willing, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just you can't expect it. However, the things that you know God wants us to be and wants us to do, He will fulfill them. Now, the corollary to this, and, and James's subject is slightly different when he's talking about this, but the, the concept applies. In James chapter 4, James says, What is the source of the quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source of your ple uh, excuse, not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? In other words, what he's talking about here is the problem between, between all you people that are fighting and arguing amongst yourselves is you're wanting to fulfill your own desires and your own wants. You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. Okay, that's the first step. You do not have because you do not ask. But then he says, you ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, so you may spend it on your own pleasures. We can't be asking for things that are for our own pleasure, just so we can spend it on that. We need to ask for the things that are genuinely good. Again, you can certainly pray for those things that you hope will happen, if God wills. But don't expect them. Okay? But this is a promise you can cling to. That if I pray for those things which are genuinely good that God asked me, I trust that He will actually accomplish them. Is He going to accomplish it in your time? Probably not. And of course, as we all kind of quip, oh, Lord, give me patience. And we're all, oh, man, I had to do all these. Yeah, that's what's going to happen. You pray for it, it's going to happen. Why wouldn't it? Why wouldn't he give you those trials and, and, and struggles to practice that and learn that? We get that from the beginning of James. Count it all joy. So we can be matured by those things. So we, we aren't tossed about in suffering. Okay. Now, what's a promise we can't cling to? Well, that's going to be like Deuteronomy 28 through 30. 
the covenant that God made with Israel, that if you will obey His laws, He will bless your land, there will be bountiful crops, nobody's going to miscarry, your nation will be blessed, you'll multiply tremendously, but if you don't obey, we will have you exiled into the nations, which is the promise given there. You'll go and be scattered into the nations, but when you're there and you repent and turn from your ways, the Lord will restore your nation and everything will be blessed. You can't cling to those promises. They're not for you. Okay? Now, will God return one day and establish His kingdom on earth and things will be that way? Yes, of course. But in that context, it doesn't apply to you. Now, are there principles in that text that we can cling from? Yes. The Lord looks favorably upon those who obey Him, obviously. But there are specific promises there you cannot claim. Because A, you're a Gentile, and B, you're a Gentile. Okay? So we want to be careful when we're going through the text not to try to claim promises that are not for us. Okay? There's plenty that are. But when it doesn't apply, let me be very clear to say, just because it does not apply does not, there, not mean that there are not implications and therefore applications to us to gain from these sorts of texts. Okay? I want to be very clear about that. It may not directly apply, but there are implications that, that apply to us that we can apply in our own lives. Okay? So I'm not saying Deuteronomy 28 through 30 is useless to you to read. It isn't. It, you definitely need to read it and you need to know it. But we have to be very careful about what we're actually applying from the text. Okay. All right. I've lost a bunch of my pictures. I'm sorry. I, I don't know what happened. So just application from our time today. In times of discouragement, we cannot forget the promises of the Lord, but always remember which ones are applicable. Okay. Don't forget those promises that God has made. Don't forget them because they are essential to you being able to get from day to day. I mean, we, we go day to day trusting in the Lord. In that context, would you say something about the promises that are uh, conditional and those that are... Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. There are certainly those that um, are contingent upon a particular behavior or situation, sure. Just be very, very careful about the which ones you're clinging to. Uh, because I, I always remember uh, in college I was working at a radio station and I'd never heard this before, I'm sure you have. Um, you know, he thinks he's walking on water, but he's really on thin ice. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Um, but we also have to remember the gospel message. The gospel message is this whole thing. It's not just the evangelistic gospel message. The entire thing from cover to cover is the gospel message. The entire thing is good news, that God has intervened in a dead and dying world to bring life to it, bring order to chaos, and to bring light and so the gospel is witnessed in this ancient declaration of the shepherd who would come to, our, to be our atonement. Zechariah makes these promises about, hey, this one who's going to come to re redeem and restore and to rule and bring peace to the world and bring light to the world and bring life to the world. And of course, our most important thing that we need to remember, because the, what, see if you can remember from the last time I've been here, what is the most important thing, or let me ask you a different way, why is it that we want to become more like Jesus? We hear it a lot here at CBC, becoming more like Jesus. Why? Because he tells us to. Okay, there's obedience, sure. To glorify God. There you go, to glorify God. Because when I look more like Jesus, what does the world see? Jesus. I, I'm, I, I love the scene in, in Princess Bride when he says, No, who are you? No one of consequence. I'm no one of consequence. He says, No, really, I must know your name. And he says... Well, you're going to have to learn to live with disappointment. Um, but I'm no one of consequence. But when I look more like Jesus, then people see Jesus and God has brought glory. If you have not read, and I, I've probably said this to you before, but if you have not read, Jonathan, you've got to love these New England writers during the 1800s, 1700s. If you've not read Jonathan Edwards, A Dissertation Concerning the Ends for Which God Created the World, you need to get it. It's amazing. But he, he basically takes a mathematical proof approach through scripture and reason to show that the highest aim of all things is the glory of God. It is wonderful. I, I have often said of that book, I, I would almost, almost stake my reputation on this, that it's one of the most important books written apart from the scriptures. It's, it's that important. 
Uh, great, great book. If you haven't got a chance to, uh, John Piper, I think, published a companion volume where he has a little bit of commentary at the beginning and then the full text in the back. Uh, it's called God's Passion for His Glory. Um, if you haven't got a copy of that, but it, I, it, fantastic work. But God's glory is achieved as we see His promises fulfilled and His majesty exalted in them. How wonderful to see those promises fulfilled. And, and they, we've already seen some of them fulfilled, and we will see that as we go through this class, that God says things to the prophet Zechariah, and then they happen. So, that is where we're going. Any questions for today? All my pictures have gone bye-bye. Makes me sad. Any questions? Awesome. Well, I'll obviously be here tearing down here for just a little bit, but if you have any questions, feel free to grab me. But let's pray, and we'll be dismissed, and we'll all go to worship. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your promises. And we thank you that you have accomplished mighty things through your son, Jesus. We pray, Lord, that you bless us now as we go to worship as a people together. We pray you grant us mercies and grace as we go to praise your name. We pray this all in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen.